Hello, and welcome to another one of my apes videos. This time, we'll be looking at Chapter 7, Human Populations, and we'll be starting off by talking about China. So why begin with China? Human population size, affluence, and resource consumption all have interrelated impacts on the environment. These three things have changed dramatically with China over the last 50 years. Currently, 20% of the world population resides within China, about 1.3 billion. They've had a rapid economic development going from mostly agricultural to now having the affluence to go out to restaurants and to pay for piano lessons and other things like that. So they've had a dramatic shift in their affluence. On top of their economic development, they are also polluting more. So they are already the largest producer of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. And they're soon to be the world's largest economy, which will get them into more cars, give them more technology, and probably pollute more in the end. So population is very much so tied to the environment, and that's why we are taking a deeper look into populations and how they So not far behind China lies India, and then very far behind that lies the USA, Indonesia, Brazil, and so on and so forth. So you can see that there are some very, very large changes to our world population because of those two booming civilizations, right? China and India. An important thing to remember when talking about populations of humans is that we've never had this many people on Earth. Having these large populations is a brand new concept and one that scientists are often disagreeing about in terms of, well, how many people can actually live on Earth. Every five days, the global population increases by one current population is about 7.75 billion and is projected to continue to increase uh, rapidly uh, until, well, they're not exactly sure. Another question might be, well, why haven't we had such large populations before? This changed about 400 years ago when agriculture, sanitation, vaccines, healthcare, those types of things were being developed. And so we could sustain more people with more food. We could keep people alive longer with having better sanitation, better health care to keep people into their old age, and so the human population naturally increased through all of these advances. But again, the question is, can we continue that pace and can we let people grow and have families, or are we going to hit a cap? In this slide, we take a deeper look at Earth's carrying capacity. On the first graph labeled A, you can see that our population size is below the food supply, so we can continue to grow exponentially as we've been doing. But once it passes that certain critical value uh, at about 80 years from when it was measured, you can see that there is a switch between the two, where you now go into that red food deficit. This was first proposed by Thomas Malthus, who in the late 1700s saw that, well, you have so many people on earth, you have so much food, eventually you might not be able to keep up with food production, which is going up linearly. So eventually you might have an overshoot. But because of technology, because we have thinkers that are solving these problems, perhaps with innovation, we can artificially make our food go up. So that leads to B, right? Significant improvement in agricultural technology might have the spike that can keep our population growing. But again, how far can innovation take us? How far will that bring the food supply and how many people can the earth support? It's a question that we don't have the answer to. So this brings us to the question of why are populations growing? And there are a few factors that play into this. Changes in population size, fertility, which is how many offspring each family is having, life expectancy, how old people are living, the age structure, of a population, if there's a lot of young people, if there's a lot of old people, or if there's a lot of reproductive age people, that will play into how a population grows. And lastly, we look at migration. So are people immigrating, emigrating? What is the flow of people into that country? Immigration would be the movement of people into a country, whereas emigration would be out of a country. And so we can talk about, instead of looking at both, we could talk about the net migration rate, right? Overall, are they taking people into their country or are they having people leave the country? The United States takes in quite a few immigrants, whereas somewhere like Japan does not take in hardly any immigrants. So there are going to be big differences between different countries. 
This, of course, along with birth rates and death rates, is going to be what changes your population size. If you have a lot of people immigrating into your country and you have a lot of births, a high birth rate among women, you're going to be increasing your population size. If you have a high amount of deaths and emigration, then you're going to have a larger output. You're going to be decreasing your population size. When talking about births and deaths, we can talk about the crude birth rate and the crude death rate. Now these are called crude because they are statistics out of 1,000 individuals roughly per year. So they're not the most exact pinpoint accurate data points, but they give you a very, very strong sense of what is going on in the greater population. These two numbers, of course, lead us then to some of the calculations that you'll be using for the AP exam. The first one is global population growth rate, which is the crude birth rate number minus the crude death rate number over 10. Now you'll remember that these are out of 1,000, but because we want this as a percentage, in the end you'll be multiplying by 100. So by skipping both of those steps, we can just simply put those two numbers over 10 and end up with the percentage. Then we have the national population growth rate, which for the same reason is over 10, but now we're looking at a country. So we have the immigration and the emigration to get a better idea of the flow of people and if that population in that country is going to be increasing or decreasing. Lastly, once you find the growth rate from either of these two formulas, you can use the doubling time equation, which is 70 over the percentage growth rate uh, don't use the decimal, just put the number, and that will tell you how long it takes for that population to double based on its current growth rate. So before I had mentioned something about fertility, well, what exactly is the fertility rate? Fertility rate is an estimate of the average number of children that each woman in a population will bear in her childbearing years. So over all of the years that you could be having children, how many do they have? Now this is important because if there's a group where you are having seven children per mother, you're going to experience a very, very high growth rate if your death rate is low. We'll get into this in a little bit. Replacement level fertility is another one of these terms that is extremely important because it tells you what the fertility needs to be to keep your population stable without growth. So it's the total fertility rate required to offset the average number of deaths in a population and for the current population size to remain stable. It's approximately 2.1 children for developed countries. So each female throughout all of her childbearing years will have somewhere around two. You know, some people have three, but it'll average out to about 2.1 to make your country completely stable in terms of growth. So this would be a zero growth. But the replacement level fertility is not the same for every place. Keep in mind that you are going to have a different death rate in different places, right? There's different healthcare, different technology. So in developed countries where you have a high level of industrialization and income, you're going to have that replacement level at about 2.1, like I said before. But if you're in a developing country where you don't have the healthcare, uh, you have a high level of infant deaths, you're going to probably have a number that is over 2.1. And it's going to vary depending on which place you look at. This brings us to a very powerful tool called the age structure diagram, often shown by population pyramids. These are visual representations of age structure within a country for males and females. So when you're looking at these diagrams, you wanna look at three different groups shown by the three different colors. The dark green at the base are your children, those who are not reproductive yet and will be in a few years. The medium green is going to be the reproductive part of your population. So these are the folks that are going to be having offspring and contributing to that bottom part of the pyramid. And then you have those who are past their reproductive years in that lighter pea green, uh, where they are living into old age or if it tapers off. So for India, for instance, you can see that it has a wide base and it has a rather large population of reproductive individuals. You can also see that there is that taper off into the top at a point. It is going to be that not many people live into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now take a look at the United States population. You can see that the dark green on the bottom is actually lower than the reproductive group. They are having less children, which is something you can infer from that part of the diagram. You can also see that there is a larger population growing into their old age. 
and there's also a skew of females to males, predominantly because of war and uh, the fact that females in the U.S. just live longer than males. Because of the two different shapes that you see between India and the United States, you can see that India is growing. They are having many children and their reproductive is growing. You can see for the United States that our population is pretty much stable, right? The layers from 50 and down are just about the same. This means that there is a difference in our population growth versus India's, where India is growing fast and we are not really growing that much at all. Now take a look at Germany. Germany is not having many children. There is a large portion of the population that is old, is inverted. You can see that instead of shrinking at the top like India and having a wide base, it has a bulge near the middle top and now it is shrinking towards the bottom. So they are not at replacement level fertility, they are a shrinking population. If you look at China, China has had many interesting things occur with the one child policy like we mentioned before, and you can see that it's hard to place exactly what's going on with their population, except for one large fact. The reproductive group is quite large, so they will continue to have children even though the base looks to be shrinking as opposed to Germany where that reproductive group is shrinking as well. So you can take a look at that middle section and say a lot about what's going to happen in the future. Another tool we can use to make predictions about populations is something called the demographic transition model. This has four stages that show what happens to a population as it goes through industrialization and development. So in the first phase of this transition model, you have slow population growth because you are pre-industrial. There are high birth rates and high death rates because you are having many kids to offset the amount of deaths, and so your population growth is slow. This is a time when your population or your country does not have the technology and the sanitation to make sure that everyone is healthy and so you have that high death rate. In phase two, you start to have a little bit of development. Some technology comes in, some medical care comes in, and this leads to a huge rapid population growth because birth rates remain high, but death rates decline due to better sanitation, clean drinking water, increased access to food and goods, and access to healthcare. So think about it this way. In phase one, they were used to socially and culturally having about six children and all of a sudden you've made it so that instead of half of them passing because of the poor conditions you were living in now there's medical care and things to keep them alive so if you're used to having six kids you're probably going to continue having about six five four children so the population growth is going to be very very strong it is going to continue to increase a lot because those families are stuck having as many kids as their parents had after that phase after this rapid boom eventually this leads to industrialization so the industrialized phase three also forgot to mention phase two is called the transitional period the phase three is in the industrial period though Stable population growth as the economy and education system improves and people have fewer children. So this is when the birth rates really start to decline. They start to come closer to the death rate. So you'll still have a stable population growth. And that will eventually lead to stage four. This is the post-industrial. This is a place like Germany where we saw in the population pyramid their population was shrinking, also like Japan. So declining population growth because the relatively high level of affluence and economic development encourages women to delay having children. So these are the four different steps and we'll see a graph to outline this a little bit better. Here we have the demographic transition model shown with the phases at the top, phases one to four, and you can see the birth rate in blue and the death rate in orange. Now in some of the more detailed graphs, you'll see that the birth rate and death rate in phase one are intertwined. They have that little uh, going back and forth, uh, dueling with each other, but here they're shown to be just a little bit of a distance apart to make it easier to read. You can also see that the population size is shown in that purple underneath those two. So in phase one, the population size is small, right? Because birth rate and death rate are close to each other and you'll have a small bit of population growth. 
Then you can see the birth rate doesn't change much in phase two. The death rate though declines. You can see here that the population is going to rise greatly. In phase three, you can see that your birth rates start to come closer to your death rates. And so that will lead the population size to stop growing as fast, but it's going to continue to grow nonetheless. In phase four, where your birth rate and your death rate just about meet, that is when your population size will start to level off and perhaps even decline. So as a country goes through the demographic transition model, you're going to have a big change in your GDP, the value of all products and services produced in a year in that country. And that is going to change the affluence, right? That's going to change the amount of money that people have. And so as the GDP is increasing, you have an increase of consumer spending, investments, government spending, and exports minus your imports. And so that's going to correlate with pollution, right? They are making products. There is manufacturing occurring. They need resources. And oftentimes, if they're in a transitional phase, they're not too worried about the environmental impact that all of this is going to have. They're trying to catch up to the more developed areas. So they are going to be polluting and polluting quite a bit to catch up. So as this increases further, it might reach a point where they're able to purchase equipment to burn fossil fuels more efficiently and more cleanly, but that comes after transitioning to the most modern technology.